We're living in times of great turmoil, aren't we? Uh, I've already mentioned the, the crisis in Afghanistan and the earthquake in Haiti and how the, the pandemic has uh, caused those problems in themselves to, to be exacerbated. And uh, emergency uh, in Japan, UK deaths rising. And with all this uh, sickness and the pandemic, there's been the, the economic downturn, which has put financial pressures on a lot of us. Consequently, uh, a lot of us are under more stress than usual. And with all this self-isolating and social distancing, many people are experiencing great loneliness and mental health issues uh, are, are on the rise. Perhaps in this generation, more than ever before, we are more aware of our own mortality. In these times, perhaps uh, we might uh, be asking ourselves, if we believe in God, we might be asking ourselves, is God for me or is he against me? Does he really care? Is, does he love me? Is he good? If I was to give a title to uh, this morning's sermon, it would be, Is God Against Me? Is God Against Me? Perhaps if you're not a, a Christian here this morning, you might be thinking uh, a question that, that you've thought a long time, but perhaps you're thinking, how can you Christians believe in a God of love when there's so much suffering and grief in the world. And if you haven't suffered much or you're not suffering now, I'm sorry to say that it's almost guaranteed that you will if you live long enough. And if and when you suffer, I want you to turn to Ruth chapter one. Because Ruth chapter 1 is a message for our times. The very first verse of Ruth tells us about the times of Ruth. It says, in the days when the judges ruled. Uh, and if you look in your Bibles to just one verse before that, in the book of Judges, it tells you the summary of the book of Judges, the time of Judges. And it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The time of the judges was a time of great national disunity and spiritual uh, degradation, moral degradation. Doesn't that sound familiar? National disunity. It wasn't so long ago that we had uh, remainers and leavers debating about Brexit. Even recently, there was debates with uh, leaders in the EU, uh, I forget, was it about fish or sausages, something like that. Uh, even within uh, the United Kingdom, there's rumours that Scotland might be pushing for another referendum to leave the Union. You have um, anti-vaxxers uh, uh, speaking out against the, the medics and the, the politicians. Then you have the, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement and uh, cancel culture, no platforming, statues being torn down. Surely this is a time of national disunity. What about the moral degradation? Well, surely we see that if ever we were called a Christian nation, we're not now, are we? If anything, we're a post-Christian nation. And our, our society is, is steadily moving away from biblical values. The message you get on, on TV or in the magazines or everywhere is, you've got to be true to yourself. I, I had to be true to myself. Doesn't that sound very similar to people doing what was right in their own eyes? Our time is just like the time of the story of Ruth. And it's a great story. 
It's beautifully told. It's masterful storytelling. There's, there's romance. It's a, a, a love story. There's uh, secret rendezvous in the middle of the night. There's suspense. There's a hero. There's a quest. There's tragedy. And you could argue there's comedy as well. There's certainly merriment, and there's real drama. But chapter one of Ruth is the darkest and most painful part of the story. Twice you, you, you see it mentioned weeping. There's weeping. And twice the, the, the word bitter is mentioned. There's bitterness and weeping. And it's tempting with these difficult, painful parts of a story to gloss over them and hurry to the happy ending. Uh, and just to reassure you, there is a happy ending. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge the pain and to sit with it for a moment, to recognize the real darkness of those feelings of hopelessness so that we can more fully appreciate the bright rays of hope when we see them in the story later. There's a, a poem that I really like that some members of my family have committed to memory, a poem by Robert Browning Hamilton. I'm not gonna embarrass them by asking them to quote it, but it goes like this. It says, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. It reminds me of a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. So this morning uh, here, uh, we're going to spend a little while walking with sorrow to see what we can learn from her. And the first thing to note is that it seems as if the Lord is against Naomi. It seems as though the Lord is against Naomi. The, the story of Ruth begins and ends with Naomi, and she has this husband, a man named Elimelech, uh, which incidentally, the name means, my God is king. And they're from the town of Bethlehem in Judah. Could we have the, the, the map uh, up, please? Yeah. So um, hopefully you can see there's the land of Judah up here. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, hopefully you can see this map. Uh, and there's Bethlehem there. And uh, they travel from Bethlehem. They go to the east to the land of Moab. Now, if you know your Old Testament already, you've got alarm bells ringing because Moab was one of the enemies of Israel. They must have been pretty desperate to go to the land of Moab. In fact, you don't need to turn to it, but in Deuteronomy, God says to the people of Israel, no Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with bread on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam to curse you. They were bad guys in, in the, the book of um, the Israelites. They were the enemies and yet they leave Bethlehem because there's famine and they go east to Moab. But sadly, once they get to Moab, after they've, they're, they're there in Moab, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, my God is king, he dies. And Naomi's there in enemy territory burying her husband. So then her, um, her sons marry Moabite uh, women Again, not a good idea. But after they've been living in the land for 10 years, Naomi's sons also die. And there she is burying her two sons. But then she hears that there is food in Judah. So she decides to go back home to Bethlehem. She says farewell to her daughters-in-law and Orpah, one of her daughters-in-law, finally uh, decides to go back to her mother's house. But uh, Ruth stays with her and Naomi and Ruth, they, they go back to Bethlehem. And when they arrive, there's a, a stir in the town 
Uh, you can imagine when uh, Lorna has been in, in Birmingham and she comes back to Clitoch, there's a stir in the town, ah, oh, Lorna's back. Uh, in a similar way, the, the people in the town are saying, ah, oh, Naomi's back, is this Naomi? Perhaps after the 10 years that she'd been away, uh, she'd aged and maybe was unrecognizable, but uh, she wasn't her normal, pleasant self. And she says, don't call me Naomi. Um, in verse uh, 20, she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mark. You may have a footnote in your Bible where it explains that Naomi means pleasant and Mara means bitter. Don't call me pleasant, call me bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I, I used to think that in this part of the story, Naomi is, a, is being a bit sorry for herself. This is self-pity. But as I was looking at this again to prepare for this morning, I'm more sympathetic uh, to Naomi's position. And if you look back at verse 13, where she again mentions the word bitter, it's not self-pity. Listen to what she says to her daughters-in-law. She says, No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She's concerned for them. She has pity for them. This isn't self-pity. And for another thing, think of what she's been through. There's been famine, three funerals, and a farewell. Firstly, the, the famine. There was famine in the land of Judah, in, in their hometown of Bethlehem. Now, if you know uh, your, your Old Testament, you know that the, the land of, of Judah that was the promised land. God said, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, a fertile, good land. Not only that, the town Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem means house of bread. Why was there famine in, in this land of Judah, in the house of bread? You can sympathize with Naomi. Maybe she was thinking, why, Lord? Where's the bread? There was famine. She also had three funerals. Her son's names mean sickness and destruction. I don't know whether they were named with, with irony, but she leaves Bethlehem with sickness and destruction. Her husband dies and her two sons die. Most, if not all of us, know what it's like to lose a loved one in your family. Some of us know what it's like to bury a spouse or a child. You can understand why Naomi would have been bitter. She had a famine, there was three funerals, and a farewell to one of her daughters-in-law. And as she's saying goodbye to her, her daughters-in-law, uh, she says, you know, I, I have no sons. Uh, and in um, verse 12, it says, I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, you can, you can hear the sense of hopelessness in, in the language that she's using here. If I were to have hope, she has nothing. She has no hope. I wonder if you ever feel hopeless, like the, the situation you're in is hopeless, whether you feel despair. I know I sometimes do. And it's no wonder then that Naomi says, the Lord is against me, in verse 13. It's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then you, you see in verse 20, 21, she says it again. 
but she knows that God is in control. So uh, in, in verse 20, she says, The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? He's the Almighty. He can do anything he wants to. Well, why doesn't he do something? Why has he brought this calamity on me? The Lord is against me. You notice she says the Lord is testifying against me. It sounds to me like the language of, of punishment in, in a court. He's testifying against her. Perhaps Naomi feels that she uh, is, is guilty of not trusting God in the promised land, the house of bread, not trusting God to provide for her, and so fleeing to the enemies of Israel. I wonder if you have ever felt that God is punishing you for something you've done wrong. Maybe, like Naomi, you're, in your heart you cry out, Why, Lord? Why are you letting this happen? Where's the bread? It seems that the Lord is against Naomi. Secondly, Ruth is for Naomi. Ruth is for Naomi. In this chapter, Ruth is like a ray of hope, uh, a much-needed comfort in a seemingly hopeless situation, like a candle in a dark room. So in verse 6, Naomi hears that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Uh, it's interesting to note that the word that is translated food in this version of the Bible, it could mean food or bread. Um, the, the, the name Bethlehem, it means house of bread. Bethel, uh, this church is named house of God. Bethel means house of God. Bethlehem uh, is house of bread. It's the same word lehem that is used here. The word lehem can mean food or bread. It reminds me in Japanese uh, of the word gohan. And thankfully my Japanese stepmother is here. What, what does the word gohan mean in English? It means meal or rice. or rice. So it can mean meal or food or rice. Thank you, Yuko. Yes. So the word here, uh, it can mean food or it can mean bread. So the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. So Naomi leaves Moab. She tells her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. There's lots of weeping. They say, oh, we'll go with you. But Naomi says, I have nothing. I have no sons for you to marry. No, go back to your mother's house. Find rest uh, in your husband's house. Find a new husband. So Orpah leaves, but Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth clings to Naomi. Look at verse 16. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. This is a remarkable speech from Ruth. She is voluntarily going to a place where she will be a foreigner, an outsider, an enemy of the people of Israel, uh, she's leaving her own family and friends, her own people, her, her homeland, her religion, her culture. She's leaving all of that. For what? Well, in those days, widows would have been very vulnerable without a, a breadwinner to look after them, to provide their daily bread and to protect them. And yet, Ruth says to Naomi, nothing but death will part me from you. But considering their situation, she might die pretty soon going with Naomi back to Bethlehem. It's like saying to an, an Afghan refugee, 
uh, let, let me go with you back to Afghanistan. I'll buy a one-way ticket and uh, we'll be unemployed. Um, I'll be an outsider, an enemy of the people there. It'll be a foreign culture and we'll be, we'll be un unemployed and, and we'll beg on the streets. That's a great idea, isn't it? And yet Ruth goes with Naomi. The name Ruth means friend. And what a friend she was to Naomi. So Ruth and Naomi, they come from the east and travel to Bethlehem because they had heard in the east that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. And then the chapter ends in verse 22 with a summary of, of the story so far and a bit of a cliffhanger as well, uh, like in those uh, TV programs where they, they end on a cliffhanger and you're, you're thinking, what's going to happen next? So it says, Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite with her daughter-in-law with her, um, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. They came to the house of bread at the beginning of the barley harvest. And you can sense that hint of hope. Maybe bread is on the way. What's going to happen? Well, whatever happens next, it's clear that Ruth is for Naomi. So firstly, it seems the Lord is against Naomi. Secondly, Ruth is for Naomi. But thirdly, actually the Lord is for Naomi. The Lord is for Naomi. Naomi will know this for herself in later chapters uh, in the book of Ruth. But what Naomi didn't know then was that about a thousand years later, there were going to be other travelers who came from the east and traveled to Bethlehem because they had heard that the Lord had visited his people. So we get to the New Testament, to a book of the Bible called Matthew. Uh, and in, in Matthew's gospel, we, we hear that a baby is born and they call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This baby is God with us, born in Bethlehem. The Lord had visited his people in Bethlehem. And uh, we read in, in Matthew chapter 2, it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose in the east and have come to worship him. So the, Herod the king, he gets together his priests and, uh, the priests and scribes and asks them, uh, Where is the Christ to be born? And they say, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. God had visited his people in Bethlehem. A baby had been born called God with us. And not only that, this baby would grow up to become a man who would go around teaching people all about that area and say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. We read in, in John's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone that looks on the Son, and Jesus is talking about himself there, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now that last bit might seem a little bit odd. What does he mean? It's flesh. He's going to give his flesh to eat. Even the people listening at the time were confused. But to understand it better, we can go to another story in, in the Gospels. It was the night before Jesus was nailed to a cross to die. 
and he had supper with his disciples, one of the perhaps the most famous scene in, in uh, Western art, the, the Last Supper. And at this supper, it says that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. And he said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. Some versions say broken for you. Ruth said to Naomi, nothing but death will part me from you. Jesus said to me, in my death, I will give you life. I will be a friend beyond death. Yes, we may suffer. Yes, we may be grieved. And we may sympathize with Naomi and cry out to God, why, Lord, why are you letting this happen? Why are you letting me suffer like this? Why is there famine? Where's the bread? And Jesus comes and says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread from heaven. Eat this bread and live. Believe in me and have eternal life, says Jesus. As he gives his body for you. As his body is broken for you. If you believe in Jesus, you have this bread, the bread that leads to no more hunger, that leads to eternal life, forgiveness of sins, satisfaction. Jesus tells us this morning to accept the free gift of eternal life by believing in him. And if you're not a Christian here this morning or watching on YouTube or Facebook, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, why not? He is offering himself to you, the living bread from heaven that leads to satisfaction and eternal life. So put your trust in him today receive this living bread from heaven by faith accept this free gift of eternal life we may never know in in this life why god allows us to suffer there was a, a hymn writer who, who lived many years ago called william cooper who knew what it meant to suffer. He battled with hopelessness and despair most of his life. On several occasions, he tried to take his own life. And yet, he writes these words, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. You see what William Cooper is saying here. We may see clouds. We may think the Lord is against us, but actually those clouds are designed to pour down blessings on us. We may see God as a, as a frowning providence, and yet behind that frown is a smiling face. He is for us. He is to do us good. As it says, the bud may have a bitter taste. Naomi knew bitterness, the suffering and the grief that she experienced. 
But as William Cooper says, sweet will be the flower. It will bear fruit that will be sweet. As I say, we may never know in this life why God allows us to suffer, but what we do know is that it is not meant as punishment if you are trusting in Jesus this morning. It is not punishment. Naomi may have thought the Lord is testifying against me as if he's punishing me for something I did wrong. But we know that Jesus, when he died on that cross, he took all the punishment for all of our sins, for those of of us who trust in Jesus, both our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, those little sins that we think don't matter, those big sins that we're so ashamed of, we don't want to tell anyone about them, all of our sins, the punishment has been paid. There is no more punishment to give. So we know that whatever reason it is, it's not for punishment that the Lord lets us suffer. And we know that whatever reason God is letting us suffer, we know that it is not because the Lord is against us. It is not because the Lord does not love us. The Lord has given us proof of that by sending his son, the Lord Jesus, to die for us to give his body for us, for his body to be broken for us. If you believe in Jesus, he is definitely for you. However much it may seem like the Lord is against you, he is for you. The Lord has visited his people in the house of bread, and has sent living bread from heaven, the bread of life. So if ever you're tempted to think, the Lord is against me, I want you to look at Ruth chapter 1 and remember the bread of life given for you, broken for you. And remember that God is for you.